Well, hello again, everybody. It's me. It's your old buddy, Steve Simonson, recording on the Awesomers podcast episode of the day in our continuing Founder Foundations mini-series. Now, today we are going to continue into the marketing introduction section of this foundational uh, program. And we've already discussed in, in previous episodes some of the core tenets that relate to marketing. And, and particularly at a, at a product level. Today, we're gonna fly up and talk about the brand positioning and the differentiation of that brand so that you can kind of tie the whole story together. So a lot of people have already heard about, you know, having a, a unique selling proposition, although most of us pay lip service to that. And we go, uh, I'm gonna sell the highest quality uh, product at the lowest price and deliver the best customer service. And that's my USP. And uh, that is definitely not you. Nothing unique about that selling proposition. In fact, that's what everybody says. Uh, it's lazy and it's inaccurate and it's um, nobody believes it. So it, it, any customer who you ever pitched that kind of USP to will see right through it. And they'll go, all right, just how, how's this clown compared to every other clown? And there is really no differentiation in most USPs. So um, my objective today is to say, well, how do you take differentiation past the product level and make it into a brand attribute, make it into something that your brand stands for? And for those who may recall uh, prior episodes, I've talked about the company story and I did a longer in-depth company story podcast uh, sometime back where I talked about companies like Tom Shoes and uh, you know Chipotle and, and other uh, companies that, in fact, do create and have created uh, a true USP. And whether you agree with their USP or like their food or shoes or whatever, it's quite irrelevant. It's, it's only a question of they looked at the market and they said, oh, guess what? We're going to be different than everybody else in the market. So as you're you know, brand differentiation concept begins, you must start by looking at what your your competition is. You've got to determine, you know, what are they offering and, and where do we fit into that? And what is our um, kind of go-to-market angle to disrupt this existing market? You know, all of these people are market makers. And we'll use the, you know, an e-commerce situation, whether you're selling on somebody like Shopify or you know, your own uh, Amazon FBA brand, there are existing sellers of your product. Very few times does a totally novel product come down the pike. Even the people who say, this is totally novel, and I've got a patent on it. Often it's some subtle little detail and it's like, oh, well, that that really, it, it's nuanced. It's It's fine. I got no problem with it. I don't, in fact, think that you need to reinvent the wheel to be able to sell a product and create a brand. Uh, quite the opposite. I think you can create brands from basically any product category. It doesn't require some, you know, uh, Einstein uh, level of, you know, kind of brain power or, um, you know, inventiveness. It just needs somebody who says, I see this niche in the market that is missed or underserved or this annoys me. Um, the old Gillette razor guy is like, you know, I, I got tired of getting... Uh, ripped off by uh, razors, and so I created my own company. Ironically, then ripped off everybody for a couple of decades, and so you know the people from you know some of the next um, in Dollar Shave Club or those types of folks came down and said, "Now, now we're tired of getting ripped off by the the razor companies, and so here's our cheap razors." And then they keep raising the price and get bought out by multi billion dollar conglomerates, and then the next guys come along and go, "Hey, we're tired of cheap razors, right?" So timing is is important but it's also relative to what's happening in your market today so before you conclude what your brand positioning and differentiation could be you have to actually consider what does the landscape look like uh at large in your in your category that's obviously quite relevant now once you understand that that greater landscape then you want to start figuring out how you can differentiate now, sometimes people differentiate on the physicality of the product. Ours is, you know, stronger. If anybody remembers the old Samsonite luggage, right? They'd have gorillas jumping on it. Goes, look at uh, the, if it could stand up to a gorilla, it can stand up to your kids, right? And or the the people at the luggage place that throw the thing for distance, 
and uh, break new Olympic records daily. So all of those types of things, whether it is price, whether, by the way, I don't recommend price. That is uh, the easiest, weakest marketing play ever is just to go, we're selling at a cheaper price. Unless you have some critical breakthrough in production, the capacity to make items at a substantially, substantially lower price than your competition, price is not it. And I'm not saying those don't exist. Okay, I want to be very clear about that. Some people can redefine how manufacturing works. And, you know, through whatever process that is, they can then say, now I can offer this at a lower price. In the old days, that price used to simply be, um, I'm buying stuff that was made in America and now it's made in Japan or it's made in China or some other place that has cheaper fill in the blanks, labor, raw materials, whatever it is. And then I'm shipping it over and now I'm disrupting based on price. That works, but everybody can copy that and it's not uh, very defendable. So having a differentiation that is in fact defendable would be uh, obviously ideal. Now, I also want to point out that there are tangible aspects, which I just alluded to, the physicality and so on, but there are also intangible things. And one of the things that we used to do is we would trademark attributes about our product. So if we were selling, let's say, uh, desks, we might say this desk has this particular uh, finish over the wood that we kind of made our own brand of. And we would even make some nuanced uh, attempt to make that finish be brighter or stronger or more scratch resistant or whatever the the case of the day happened to be. So we would essentially use the same, you know, coatings that everybody else did, but we would add some little element that made it a little bit different and a little bit marketable. And then we would trademark it and go, you know, uh, these desks are exclusive with the Steve's finish is the best uh, kind of finish. You know, just call it, you know, super tough finish. Uh, forgive me for anybody who has that trademarked. But then any desk, you know, if you sell that attribute super tough as being a really cool thing and you shouldn't buy a desk without super tough coding, now only your products are under consideration by those buyers who find that particular uh, aspect to be important to them, right? And that is one element that you can put in. Just to be clear, uh, a desk is a simple example, right? A coding on a desk is a simple example. It could be the the material that you use, right? Um, my buddy Kevin has got a brand where they're just taking recycled ocean plastics and they're making that part of the product. Now that's going to be part of that brand umbrella. Makes perfect sense. That's defendable. It's unique. And people get behind it. Especially these days, younger people love to have the sense, whether it's real or otherwise, that there's a, a mission behind the brand and that they're participating somehow in making the world a better place by purchasing a specific kind of product. Again, whether it's true or not, that's what the consumer wants. Now, I definitely am a huge proponent of just telling the truth. Don't say, yes, we're you know saving penguins and then you know make all your stuff out of penguin skin. That, that would not be ideal. But I also, I, I want you to be careful of the, uh, the dangers of greenwashing. I, I think I alluded to this story earlier. I'm not sure if I shared it publicly, but there is a cell phone company. Uh, they have started running ads that go, hey, we're now 100% hydro at HQ. Meaning that we're green, so you should buy from us. And uh, we're virtuous because our competition, you know, they got some coal burning uh, power in their, their HQ. Now, just to be clear, we don't get to choose where power comes from in, in power grids. That HQ was powered by hydro for the last 30 years, had nothing to do with this marketing nonsense. And the other guys have no choice uh, about where their power comes from any more than any of the rest of us do. You know, the grid is the grid and you get your power based on what's locally available. My point is, even if it sounds good, if it is hollow or you know, otherwise um, could be construed as a lie. I don't think it's the right thing to do. That's just me. Plenty of people are like, hey, now I'm making this product without formaldehyde or, you know, formaldehyde free. 
as if they are implying that their competition has formaldehyde in it or some other, you know, noxious chemical, but it never had formaldehyde. And I'm just pulling random examples out here. My whole point is your brand needs to stand for something true. It actually should be unique. Um, you know, when people say unique selling proposition, I do want you to drive to that. And it also becomes a barometer for everything that your brand does, right? You, you're building some sort of um, offering set around a brand, whether it's a service and it's like, we just focus on Shopify sellers, or we just focus on uh, Fortune 500 companies, or we, uh, as a product business, we only make products that are, you know, recyclable. Or I uh, own a, a company, iBamboo. We haven't operated in uh, that particular brand. I sold uh, out some time ago, but I still own the domain, iBamboo. Like, if I brought that back, I would only make products made of real authentic bamboo, not fake stuff, as so many people do. So brand positioning, brand differentiation is a critical component of what you do. It goes beyond the commoditization of the product. It goes beyond, um, you know, really any of the small things. I want you to take all the lessons you've learned up, learned up until now and start to, to mesh them together and figuring out how you position your brand in such a way that all of the the sensory aspects of your brand, all of the you know right brain, left brain aspects of that brand, they all coalesce into something cohesive. Uh, hey, that's the best thing to come out of a cohesion. Uh, is this idea that you know what our first product? Uh, let's use Whole Foods as an example. They said everything that comes in here is organic. Essentially, I'm I'm paraphrasing here. So the moment that something shows up and it's not organic, including Coca-Cola, it's out, right? Can you imagine a, another grocery store saying, no, Coca-Cola, you're not welcome here because people are weak and they just want the sales and they know Coke drives traffic and people come in to buy Coke, maybe buy something else. But no, they said, we understand our differentiation. We understand our core values and we're never going to betray those, even if that means sacrificing sales today. That's what a good USP looks like. And I want you guys to, to spend time thinking about what process you can go through. And there, there are very simple steps that you can do, right? You, you want to just start thinking about what the components are of your uh, various positions could be vis-a-vis, -vis, where's my competition? How does that make me fit into it? What do I truly believe in? Uh, what are some of the customer avatars, uh, psychographics that we've already gathered up? And how does all of that come together to say, this is how we're going to position ourselves. This is how we're different. This is how we're special. And because we know so much about the psychology of our customer, we know that they're really focused on these key things. Now, I want to just leave one final little disclaimer here. This is a, a big picture issue. Most people are not going to go through this process when they're starting their business. Now, again, if this is your fourth or fifth business, then maybe you should have this in the, the early stages of your product uh, development, your, your brand development. But this is some process at some point that you should consider and go through so that you can really get all of the, the, the bones fleshed out a bit. And you can really then understand, you know, I have the, the best way to solve this problem, or I have the easiest way to, you know, um, eliminate this headache. Everything in, in business is either, you know, solving a problem or otherwise enhancing somebody's life or experience. You have to define what that is, not just at a product level, but at a brand level, and then wrap those core values around what you believe and then document it and share it, make it loud and proud throughout the organization. And then that becomes a barometer for all future marketing activities and the way that you present yourself. I hope this is helpful, everybody. Please let us know. Uh, comment, subscribe, click the notification bell, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Your help is so much appreciated. Uh, we're going to see if uh, we can grow this awesomers channel, and uh, if we do, we'll record more of these. How about that? Thanks again, everybody. Bye bye.